Hello, and welcome to our webinar, Faster Results from Supply Chain Analytics. I'm Martha Mangelsdorf, Editorial Director of MIT Sloan Management Review, and I'll be your moderator today. This event will be recorded and will be available to all attendees approximately three to four business days after the end of the live event. In addition, today's slides will be made available to attendees. We welcome your questions for our speakers today. To submit questions, please enter them anytime in the chat box in the lower corner of your screen. Or you can submit questions via Twitter using the hashtag MITSMR event. We'll answer as many questions as time permits. If you are having audio difficulties while listening via computer, please call in via telephone instead or check the help link in the upper part of your console. Our speakers today are Melissa Bowers, Beeman Professor of Business in the Department of Business Analytics and Statistics at the University of Tennessee, Adam Petrie, Lecturer of Statistics in the Haslam College of Business at the University of Tennessee, and Mary Holcomb, Professor and Gerald T. Needart Supply Chain Fellow at the University of Tennessee. Our thanks go out to UPS for their sponsorship of this webinar. And now, on to our presentation, Faster Results from Supply Chain Analytics. Adam, over to you. All right. Good afternoon, and thank you to UPS and the MIT Sloan Management Review for hosting this webinar. What we hope to do today is share the insights we have gained from the surveys of hundreds of supply chain analytics professionals and one-on-one -on -one interviews with the managers of some of the top analytics program with proven track, rec uh, proven track records. Our goal is to let you know how you might go about improving the supply chain analytics initiatives at your company, and as the title suggests, how to speed up the process of leveraging analytical insights. So I'm Adam Petrie, and I'm the data scientist of this trio here at the University of Tennessee, and I'll lead off by discussing the state of supply chain analytics in North American businesses and why analytics still matters. You will also hear from Dr. Melissa Bowers, the director of the Master's in Business Analytics program here, and Dr. Mary Holcomb, a professor in supply chain. Melissa will discuss the factors that influence the time it takes to obtain and implement analytical insights, as well as cases from actual analytics success stories. Mary will discuss five levers you can turn to decrease the analytics insight cycle time while increasing the overall quality of analytics at your company. All right, let me start out by discussing where our conclusions are coming from. We started out by surveying hundreds of personnel who were involved in all aspects of the supply chain, procurement, operations, logistics, etc. These companies specialize in general manufacturing, audio, or auto, retail, tech, transportation, food, among others, so it's a pretty wide cross-section. We then cut down the responses to about 350 managers, directors, executives, and even a few presidents who were familiar with the way analytics works at their companies. These individuals happen to have about an average of seven to 10 years at their company, so they're good responses. So basically what I'm telling you is that we ended up with pretty reliable data from companies all over the analytics spectrum, from those just starting out their analytics journey to companies that are at the forefront of the analytics game and have been doing this for decades. After studying the initial results, we became a bit curious about a few things, so we followed up with in-depth interviews of the directors of well-established analytics programs. In fact, some of these people have been at the company since the inception of the analytics program and have seen their fair share of both successes and failures. Their insights proved to be quite illuminating, and they have some really interesting things to say about how you can make supply chain analytics work at your company. But before diving into that, let me share with you one big thing that we did see in the survey, namely that analytics still matters. Now, since we had seen that the supply chain analytics capabilities were all over the place, we clustered the companies based on their responses to eight questions that really hit home how effective they were at utilizing data, whether the company had the people and talent to do analytics, and how integrated analytics was as a whole at the company. And here's what's interesting. Four clusters emerged. I'm going to refer to them as novice, apprentice, practitioner, and master. And each of these clusters happens to be well represented in the survey. And as you might guess, masters are the rarest. So how do these clusters differ? Well, the names we chose are no accident. 
the clusters represent various maturity stages of supply chain analytics at the company. Now, the novices are kind of like freshmen and they're just getting started. Not too surprisingly, analytics is not that well integrated at the company. You know, perhaps maybe just it's because it's rarely used. There aren't many people doing it. Different departments don't share data. People aren't talking with each other. Or maybe the company might not have the adequate data to begin with. Also, there's very little emphasis on analytics initiatives from executives because, well, maybe the boss has been running the company for years and is just fine with his or her naturally acquired business acumen. Now, masters are like seniors and are just the opposite. Analytics and data are integrated well across various departments. People are actually talking to each other and sharing results. And the C-suite trusts the analytics enough that the insight can be turned into action. The apprentices and practitioners fall somewhere in the middle with the level of integration of analytics and other metrics smoothly increasing from novice to master. Now, there's actually an interesting takeaway here. Nearly all measures of maturity change simultaneously within these clusters. You don't find companies with a high level of analytics integration without a top-down mandate from executives. And you don't find companies who are effective at implementing analytics insight that don't have adequate talent, data, or who don't share data or results across departments. All right, so the existence of these four clusters, it's a fun and interesting fact, but why should this matter to you? Well, it turns out that the maturity cluster you belong to tells you a great deal about how well your company is doing relative to competitors. Now, I know some of you may be somewhat skeptical at this point, and with a pretty good reason. Perhaps you haven't had that much success at your company. Maybe you've heard stories of analytics consultants coming in and giving counterproductive recommendations, or as it happens in business quite often, you might think analytics is just one of the latest buzzwords. In fact, you wouldn't be alone in thinking this. In our survey, only a little bit more than half of the respondents agreed that analytics had improved how the company does business, and that's a bit startling. So why might that be the case? Well, based on our results, it really boils down to this. The mere existence of an analytics team at your company won't guarantee success. It's really only the companies who do analytics well who have measurable advantages. And in fact, they do really have a big advantage. Let's just see how big the disparity in performance is between these four clusters. So prior to asking any questions about analytics at all, the survey respondents were asked to rate their company's performance relative to their competition in five key areas, profitability, ROA, market share, customer satisfaction, revenue growth. And then when we broke down the responses based on the maturity of the analytics program that we assigned to them, really quite a startling trend emerged. Individuals within progressively more mature analytics programs uniformly perceived their companies to have progressively larger competitive advantages. So the key takeaway is that if you aren't taking steps to advance the maturity of your analytics program, you really are lagging behind your competitors. So the three of us are actually curious as to what you think might be holding your company back in terms of its analytics. So we have a survey question for you. So in your company, what do you think is the most significant obstacle in developing and implementing supply chain analytics initiatives? So we'd like you to select one of the five following options. Is it a lack of support from upper level management, lack of user buy-in, the analytical models are just not understood by the people who would be using them. Maybe it's a lack of trust regarding analytics insight or recommendations if they might fly in the face of how stuff has always been done or maybe just a lack of talent, people that can do analytics, or maybe the analytics team is just a bunch of recent graduates who really know nothing about your business, and they might lack the critical business domain knowledge to be that helpful. Interesting questions, Adam. What, what do you find most are the most common responses? It, it's really all across the board. So personally, I've consulted pretty heavily with a home shopping business that I would say is in the novice maturity cluster. Now, they have an analytics team. They're bright people. They do pretty good work. And the president of the company is a pretty big fan of analytics. But we're still considering them to really be novices because what's really holding them back is really a mixture of B and C, a lack of user buy-in and trust for the analytics. So the show producers and the marketers have pretty strong opinions over what works because they've been just doing it for years, and they're pretty hesitant to try out new things. So even when the analytics team comes to them and shares some interesting bits of insight that might help out, they're a bit skeptical and it's a little bit difficult to implement uh, some of those recommendations. 
So they're really lacking a, a formal change management process to help build trust in that analytics. Mm -hmm. I can imagine that's a common problem. Ab absolutely, yeah. The companies that we had surveyed time and time again, and this is pretty typical of what we would expect uh, all across the board here. You know, these are these are five major problems that uh, uh, companies are going to run into, and we can see from our attendees it looks like in this case uh, the lack of talent is the the biggest thing holding holding you back. You just don't have the the right kind of people. Um, the University of Tennessee has a great master's in business analytics program and our graduates are always looking for jobs so <laughs> maybe that can solve some of your problems but yeah this is this is pretty typical we see that you know it's not the same problem that every business is facing it's a range of problems and in our later slides we're going to talk about the five levers where you can help to solve some of these problems all right so I think we're going to move on now to uh, talking about the next main chunk of our talk. I'm going to turn this over to Dr. Melissa Bowers, who's going to talk about our A-Cubed framework. Thank you, Adam. To help companies become masters in supply chain analytics, we've actually established what we call our A3 framework to drive companies toward analytic success through three basic process steps that we call awareness, analytics and action. To realize the true benefit from your analytics initiative at your organization, the first step is to identify a business problem that can be affected through analytics. And so we call this the awareness step. And the next step is to identify and apply the appropriate analytics methodologies to generate that insight or the analytics step. And the final step transforms this insight into actionable results that then positive, positively impact the bottom line of the business, the action step. So you may have engaged in analytics initiatives at your organization, but failed to realize the benefit. Well, it could be that the awareness piece is missing. Business is the environment where analytics is applied. Thus, it's absolutely imperative that analytics professionals have a basic fundamental understanding of the business to be able to ask the right questions so that they can then solve the right problem. It's the key, we say, to generating actionable insights using analytics. So, for example, Oxford Industries is a very large apparel manufacturer and they were experiencing uh, late deliveries due to what they thought um, was an insufficient number of embroidery machines in their very successful custom golf apparel business. So they called me, an analytics professional, to determine the solution to the problem as they perceived it, which was to determine the number and the type of embroidery machines to purchase to solve again what they perceived as their analytics Inside, as their analytics problem. And so Oxford had awareness and they wanted action and they called me as an analytics consultant to help solve that problem. But because I actually was very familiar with the apparel industry and the embroidery process specifically, I was then able to ask the right questions so that I could identify the right underlying problem. So I collected data that confirmed that in their case, the embroidery machines were actually idle much of the time. So I then used descriptive analytics and visualization techniques to identify the underlying cause of the problem using the analytics step here to actually realize that the excessive changeover times due to the garment embroidery schedule were the root cause of their capacity issue. So that I was then able to design a prescriptive optimization model, again resulting in action, to reduce these changeover times so significantly that it freed up enough sewing capacity to actually eliminate the need to purchase additional sewing equipment. So a cost avoidance basically on the order of about a quarter of a million dollars at the time and in addition ensure that all the garments were delivered to their customers on time, so thus turning that into actionable results. Again, all because I understood the business. 
So a fundamental understanding of the business is absolutely key to analytic success in the supply chain. All right, and I'll take it over here for one second, uh, Missy. Uh, I want to talk about what we mean by the analytics part of A3, and it's more than just the types of tools that are being used. It's not just the types of tools and the models that are being used, but it's also what types of outputs are being utilized to the company. So there are three key observations that we found in the survey. First, there really wasn't a major difference in what types of people or what types of tools people are using. If we looked at the fraction of novices that were using data mining, that was about the same fraction of the masters that were using data mining. Now, where the differences really were, however, were in the type of output that was being produced. And that's what's being showed in the graphic on this slide. What we see is that, especially for more sophisticated things like predictive and prescriptive recommendations, we see that masters are able to produce that sort of output. So while the fraction of masters and novices producing basic statistical reports and forecasts really aren't all that different, masters are just producing a lot more. They're more frequently producing things that are really going to drive the performance of the company. Now, finally, there's also a large difference in where analytics is being used. Now, this isn't pictured here in the, the plot here, but when we asked the companies where they're using analytics, is it for stockouts, fill rates, customer satisfaction, lead times, et cetera, what we found was that masters were consistently just using more tools to address this task, not necessarily more complex tools, but just throwing more just to see what helps. Uh, typically, they were using about one and a half to two and a half times more tools for each task than the novices. Now, if you think you might be in the novice cluster, you know, I actually have some pretty good news for you. Number one, it's the, not the complexity of the models that seem to really matter here. So you don't have to go out and hire the most recent PhD graduate that knows the, the state of the art. As long as you're doing some sort of analytics, you, know, you have your foot in the door. And it's the diversity and the different types of output that you're able to produce that's able to drive you up towards that master's level here. And then also, even if you are in the master's group, notice how much room there is for improvement. If you look at the percentages that are being used here uh, for these um, different outputs, we see that even masters, not even a majority of masters, are producing each one of these different types of output. So there's a lot of room for improvement, no matter really where you are along the maturity spectrum. All right, Missy, I'm going to turn it back to you for the third ingredient of A3. So the further you are um, along in the analytics arena, the bigger the opportunity that you have for gain. But this gain is not a guarantee. Awareness and analytics themselves are absolutely necessary, but not sufficient for success. You may be one of many companies out there perplexed because your analytics team has the business awareness necessary and they have a significant analytics skill set. But their analytics insights are just not generating actionable results that are positively impacting the bottom line. And that's very frustrating. If that's the case in your organization, it could be that your analytics time horizon is shorter than the time required for your supply chain to actually respond to an insight. So for example, if a forecasting model indicates a shortage, say, of 10 issues three weeks from now, but it takes four weeks for your supply chain to actually react to acquire more shoes and get them to the stores, then the insight's meaningless. The gain can only be realized in this case by shrinking that response time to the analytics. So in other words, it's important to sync the analytics time horizon with the supply chain response time to gain the potential benefit from analytics. So if you'll note on the slide, there's a significant differentiator in supply chain analytics maturity. And whether a company is actively investing in resources to sync the supply chain response time with the analytics time horizon. There's a significant difference between all the sequential phases and there's, it, you'll see there's a startling difference between masters and novices. 96% of the masters and only 6% of the novices 
are working to sync the supply chain response time with the analytics time horizon. Again, this is a significant differentiator among the phases of supply chain analytics maturity. A good example of this um, in the commercial airline maintenance business. The lead time on a, say, $50,000 critical part can be on the order of six months. So instead of waiting to test the part when the aircraft comes in, say for a 20-day sea check, and then and only then placing the order if needed because it's such an expensive part, analytics can be performed well ahead of the supply chain response time of six months. So for example, data mining can be performed on sensor data and then coupled with a text mining analysis on pilot logs to predict the need for the part six to seven months before the plane arrives for the sea check. So in this case, syncing the analytics time horizon, which is now six to seven months with the supply chain response time of six months avoids for the airlines excessive investment in inventory without a loss of service. So once the A3 framework is well established, that is your organization, your analytics group, you're able to identify appropriate business problems, apply the appropriate analytics to generate insights and then transform those insights into actionable results. You can then begin to focus on shortening the supply chain analytics cycle time. And again, we define the supply chain analytics cycle time as the time required for the company to progress through A3, which is awareness, analytics, and action. And the shorter the supply chain analytics cycle time, the more effective your analytics resources, the more effective your analytics team, and most importantly, the shorter the time frame to deliver positive analytics impact to the business in general and, and specifically to the bottom line. So let's take a closer look at how quickly you transform analytic insight into action at your organizations. So we have a polling question for you here. And I'll um, add a little bit of uh, explanation and clarity here. So let's say your organization is faced with a predicted increase in demand. How quickly could manufacturing or production change a batch size for a product? Or how quickly can procurement increase the quantity it orders from a critical supplier? So I will, oh, sorry, Martha. No, go ahead. Go ahead. So I'll add, um, if you are, you know, a novice, you know, we expect that that probably would not be immediately. If you, again, if your supply chain um, can respond extremely quickly, um, you're certainly not in the majority here. From our experience, Yeah, I would imagine that it's a, it, it varies pretty much by industry. Is that the case or not so much? And um, we see it kind of, it, it varies all over the board and not necessarily by industry. Let's see what we see here. So how quickly can your firm supply chain respond? Immediately, just as we, we thought. It's very unusual that um, an organization would be able to respond immediately within days and the next week and within two to four weeks I would have expected to be the most common response or not able to change in the short term. So this is precisely um, as we would have anticipated, Martha. Yeah. Interesting. So I'll turn it over to Mary now. Hello everyone. It's uh, my uh, pleasure to uh, talk to you about this part of our uh, research about the, the five levers that were a part of how uh, we think we're going to be able to obtain faster results from your supply chain analytics. As Adam mentioned uh, earlier, in addition to the survey, we also conducted some case studies of Fortune 500 companies. These companies were at various uh, states on their journey to becoming supply chain masters, and we thought they offered us great insights 
into formulating uh, these levers. You might uh, ask yourself the question, why did we label them levers rather than principles or even tenets? Uh, Webster's Dictionary defines a lever as an inducing or compelling force. Uh, we believe that the five levers that resulted from our study are critical to getting the results faster, and that's just what Adam and Missy talked about, uh, particularly in this analytics uh, insight cycle time that really enables a company to, to take those insights and to make sure that they enable the firm to achieve their objectives. They address how the companies can shorten that uh, time. Just a note before I proceed on to the uh, levers themselves, they're not presented in any particular rank order of importance. And so without further ado, let's look at the first lever. It addresses what I think is not a surprise uh, to many of us in the fact that uh, we have this need for the executives in the C-suite. We're talking about the CEO, the COO, uh, perhaps even the, the chief financial officer, the chief information officer to promote and support the supply chain analytics initiative. And they need to do this in both word and deed. And we'll have some examples in a couple of slides that, that really will uh, illustrate this for us. We have to create an atmosphere where analytics becomes a part of the fabric of the organization. That uh, top-down mandate gives everyone in the organization a clear understanding of what is needed and it minimizes uncertainty of direction and the objectives that we're trying to accomplish. As this chart shows, and it shows it very clearly, there's a very large difference in opinion between the various clusters uh, that Adam described for you earlier. In fact, I think he talked about uh, one of the very strong differentiators was the involvement of the, the top executives. It was one of those extremely powerful uh, discriminating uh, attributes between the, the various uh, phases. If you uh, think about the, the difference that leadership makes at uh, a company like Procter & Gamble, uh, a top-down support is an essential factor. And that support really is about the speed at which people in the organization can be influenced. Uh, as David Dittman points out in the quote we have here, it's impossible to win over thousands of people one small analytics victory at a time. And I thought that was, we thought that was such a powerful statement and he went on to say that even if you have a really good idea, uh, the numbers, if you look at that, the, the one to many, uh, the top down is just really the way to quickly get out that message, as I had said before. Dittman also noted that the speed of implementation of an analytic strategy is a key factor, and support uh, at the highest level is also critical. Uh, the analytics culture of an organization sets the stage for analytic success. Uh, as uh, you see expressed here by Baptiste Levitron at Eastman, without the clear pressure to make things happen, they will not. And I think many of us have seen this happen in our own organization. As we said, the executives in the C-suite, they have to promote, they have to support it. Uh, they have to create an atmosphere where analytics is, as we said, uh, throughout the organization, it is that fabric that seems us all together. The mindset has to be transformed to adopt a data-driven approach to decision-making throughout the organization. We have to take away this, I think, I feel, I believe. And when we talk about it being a fabric of the organization, it has to extend to our associates who are doing order fulfillment in our distribution centers to middle-level management. And it has to go, as we said, all the way up to the CEO. When uh, we asked the respondents to our survey uh, whether or not supply chain analytics was a top-down driven uh, mandate uh, by the uh, executives, only 16% of the novices either agreed or strongly agreed to that statement, and that's as opposed to the 90% of the masters. And uh, you see that that differential, uh, as we're showing here in this slide, uh, makes a, a, an incredibly big difference. And in fact, in conducting our case studies, it became strikingly evident to us that without that mandate, uh, it's progressively more difficult to advance to a higher level of supply chain analytics capability. Now, we're not suggesting that it only has to be from the top down. Remember to become a fabric of the organization, and in order to sustain that success, it really has to be across the organization. Well, that leads us to the second lever then, 
which really addresses, uh, to a certain extent, topics that both Missy and Adam have touched on before, and that's how do we uh, look at the analytical tools that we're using here. The second lever addresses the vital need really to gain user buy-in in order to decrease that analytic cycle time that Missy defined for us. We think the key to that is model simplicity and understanding that we're able to communicate to others that are going to be using those insights or the results of our models. Our study showed that the inherent complexity of models used by masters is not significantly different than the models used by the novices. And in fact, Adam pointed that out in one of his earlier uh, you know, comments about uh, how we see the differences in these clusters. And in fact, if you remember what he said, he said the difference is that they, the masters apply the analytics to more supply chain tasks. We think that's really a very uh, important statement. It's about Occam's razor, or the law of parsimony is at work here. Uh, it's a problem solving principle that says that among competing hypotheses or models in the case of our study, the one with the fewest assumptions must be selected. And that's because the simplest answer is usually correct. I think we spend a great deal of time trying to make things uh, more complicated and more complex, and yet we need to make sure that the, the simplest approach to answer the business issue is the one that we choose. In addition to simplicity, we're going to look for communication being a, a key. So in fact, uh, if you look at our quotes from our case studies that we have here, Gary Kinney at Procter & Gamble noted that if a user doesn't understand an analytic model, they will not use it. And that was kind of the theme that we heard again and again in our case studies. Uh, if the models are viewed as unnecessarily complex, enigmatic black boxes, they, in most cases, won't be successful. So for example, if an analytics recommendation is perceived as disruptive, it contradicts the managerial instinct. Uh, the Coca-Cola Refreshments case study directly addressed this issue. If users don't understand a model seemingly contradictory results, uh, as we said, they won't use it. Uh, for Coca-Cola Refreshments, this meant uh, that analytic supply chain models needed to have three different aspects. They had to be simple, they had to be transparent, but remember they also have to be effective. They have to be able to offer that insight. And buy-in depends on the analytics professional being able to explain the model in terms that anyone, and I'll stress that, anyone in the organization can understand. The simpler the model, the easier it is to both uh, explain and understand, and it's going to increase the likelihood that users will readily embrace it. So when you're looking to hire those analytical professionals, and uh, according to our earlier poll, talent was one of the things uh, that is the issue for uh, many organizations, then we have to make sure that they have those uh, excellent analytical skills, but they also have to be able to have those excellent visualization and communication skills. Missy talked about the visualization tools and skills that she used in her project, and I think that's one of the ways for which we can uh, make sure that that communication is at the level that we needed. So when we have those complex models, we can explain those results in terms that everyone can understand. Uh, it's like telling the story with the data and the analytics to gain that buy-in. So the solution should only be as complex as absolutely necessary and no more. Lever three addresses the knowledge area. Uh, the supply chain is a particularly rich area in which analytics can be used to improve performance because of its complexity. It's a very dynamic uh, atmosphere and environment that we're in because of the global nature of it. And we also have a great deal of volatility. Uh, insights gained from analytics enable the firm to be more efficient, to be more effective, and that's important because supply chain tasks really significantly impact costs and profitability. So what's going on? We have technology today that uh, enable organizations to really gather enormous amounts of information about their supply chain. Uh, but few companies are actually deriving uh, value from that supply chain data that they're accumulating. Instead, they're struggling with how to make practical use of what they learned from it. So what we discovered uh, in our case studies that may help us shed some light on this conundrum is that gaining value from analytics begins with possessing domain knowledge. You have to have a complete and thorough understanding of the key business processes and their impact on the bottom line. And we see here, uh, we have two examples that uh, we present to you. 
uh, because without that fundamental understanding of the business, a supply chain analytics model will be developed, it, it uh, will be deployed, but it's going to be a very tall order, uh, if not impossible, to make sure that it's going to help us move forward. Uh, there are some that think that uh, if, if you're in uh, whatever business, it doesn't matter if it's lawnmower parts or making chocolate chip uh, cookies, inventory is inventory. And, and yet uh, our case study of Gulfstream showed that that simply was not the case. Gulfstream realized that without sufficient domain knowledge, an external vendor wouldn't, uh, would face an insurmountable challenge when tasked with creating an inventory management system. Thus, they made the decision to develop their own in-house one. Likewise, Procter & Gamble acknowledged that it's critical to lead their analytics in-house, not delegating it to a consulting firm, uh, because in, in the words of both Dittman and Kinney, uh, consultants may not have as deep a comprehensive understanding of the business as the people themselves. Uh, they said otherwise you can increase the probability that more problems and solutions uh, will result. Uh, we uh, really like the statement here by Ben Martin of Haynes Brands. Uh, ben is one who really uh, uh, cuts right to the chase in terms of this why the business domain knowledge is so important. He said that without that end-to-end -end understanding, uh, we certainly might be able to do the analytics, uh, but what one can end up with is nothing more than fun and interesting facts. That leads us to talking about lever four. Part of what you'll notice about that is that in lever two, uh, when we talked about that one, we talked about uh, the fact that buy-in was critical to reducing the supply chain analytic cycle time. It addressed the need in lever two from a modeling and communications perspective. Lever four, however, focuses on the trust in the results in order to successfully operationalize the supply chain insight in a timely fashion. I'm just gonna state this as simply as I can. Users have to trust the analytic insight. If they don't, we're going to have issues. The adage that we say easier said than done applies here because it's hard to act when you believe that the results of the analytics aren't congruent with either your past experiences or your gut instincts. So less than 20% of our survey res uh, respondents strongly agree that their company is effective at analyzing supply chain data. So how do we build that trust in that supply chain analytics insight? Coca-Cola Refreshments offers a really great example and a way of, of how to take care of that. They were experiencing out of stocks uh, in their on-shelf availability and uh, their product in large stores. Most of those out of stock issues were due to incorrect order quantity issues and it wasn't poor demand forecasting or an inadequate holding power in the stores. So what they did, if you look at this, and let's start on that left-hand side. So they created a simple model as possible. They had an order replenishment algorithm that was built because it was easier for users to understand, buy into, and operationalize it. Along with that new algorithm, they uh, also created and implemented a closed-loop change management process, and it rolled out with the model. Now, I happen to think that that bottom portion of this you know, process model is the one that built the, you know, that actually brought home the trust in the analytics. Because uh, any time a user didn't trust the system and they uh, had the ability to override the analytic model, they were provided feedback on whether or not their manual override led to an improvement or decline in on-shelf uh, availability. So this truly created a closed-loop feedback system that taught the users to trust the analytics. The model was a, a huge success in large part, we think, uh, due to the uh, deployment approach that centered on change management processes that cultivated trust in the analytics. Well, we've talked about this one before. The lever five addresses the supply chain uh, talent or in the analytics specifically. Uh, you can look at any number of articles, white papers, and presentations currently. And this seems to be a, con, you know, a thing that's running through all of them. Supply chain talent is hard to acquire. Supply chain analytics talent or analytics talent is especially, especially I think, if you think about firms that, that need this particular thing, it's a concern because, as we stated at the beginning, it can significantly impact that cycle time. So to, in order to reduce that time, a company has to develop its talent and uh, supply chain analytics 
and that leads to a manner that we're blending that capability seamlessly throughout the organization. We have two examples of companies uh, of how they deploy this particular level, and it's Eastman and Haynes brand. And they each have very different approaches that they use. At Eastman, a new analytics uh, talent uh, they're embedded in the operations before moving into a corporate uh, supply chain analytics group that they have. Uh, they feel like by implanting the new analytics talent in the operations before moving him or her into a corporate level group, uh, the supply chain analytics capability is disseminated more quickly throughout the company. This process of diffusion across business unit cultivates deep uh, fundamental domain knowledge that we talked about before, and then it's integrated into the uh, analytics expertise. Now, Haynes Brand takes a, a different approach in how they diffuse and integrate their supply chain analytics talent. They have a center of excellence that leads the analytic efforts within their business functions, such as supply chain, distribution, marketing, and sales. So this group began as a small collection of analytical pressures, uh, many of them from which uh, they came from the uh, consulting industry. So when they have new hires now, what they do is they have this strong mentoring program where that new hire will uh, become a part of a project team and they will have a more senior mentor who really helps guide them through uh, the whole uh, analytics uh, process and how that happens in the organization. And the new team members utilize the framework while they're serving on that analytic project with their mentor. And as the understanding of the business grows, it's integrated seamlessly within their analytic skill set. The bottom line is this, there is no one organizational structure model that's effective for how to diffuse supply chain analytics talent. Uh, the results from our survey also confirmed uh, what we learned from that as well. Uh, so you'll see that in, uh, it's not really necessary for companies to have a standalone analytics uh, department. Uh, you see that most companies are housing it in operations. Uh, that was consistent with other findings that we had that showed that uh, uh, most companies are using the analytics as a way to reduce costs. That was about 56% uh, of our respondents. We do know that the worst thing that you can do is that you can hire a data scientist, put them in a cubicle, and throw problems over the wall. Now I'm going to turn it back over to Missy because you might be asking yourself at this point, so we've talked about the A-Cube framework, we've talked about the five levers, and, and we've said that this is going to become the basis for competition and growth in the future. So are there any examples out there of companies that are doing this? Missy? So we'll close with, with an example of supply chain analytics at its best. Haynes Brands Inc. uses analytics to close the gap between insight and the supply chain responsiveness. Haynes actually recognizes that if they know today there will be a shortage of, say, men's t-shirts in two weeks from now, that that insight is of no benefit if the minimum lead time necessary to acquire more t-shirts is four weeks. So, Haynes Brands actually is turning to machine learning to design predictive models to sense supply chain issues in time to execute prescriptive measures to mitigate the variation that we know will occur in every supply chain. So, Haynes synchronizes the time required for analytic insight with their supply chain response time to remove that variation from their apparel supply chain. They use analytics to predict when, in time, specific supply chain issues will arise so that they can then mitigate that impending issue through a very prescribed, planned set of actions. Their predictive models incorporate supply chain data from external and internal sources to determine the likelihood of an inability to satisfy demand at a particular time. And so um, once they detect that inability to satisfy demand, a prescriptive action can be launched to mitigate the issue depending on the time when Haynes senses that impending supply chain issue. So for example, if an inventory outage is predicted to occur, Haynes will assess the available options depending on the time available for a response. And they choose the supply chain response to sync 
with the analytics time horizon. So the action, for example, prescribed, uh, say, could involve things such as a change in a mode of transportation, uh, a resequencing of manufacturing orders, or resequencing of purchase orders. And, and so Haynes is able to, again, close the gap between this analytics insight time horizon and their supply chain response time through a very prescriptive execution management system. So if that's not how supply chain analytics works at your company, rest assured you're not alone. Only a few companies have developed an ability, to our knowledge, to react this quickly to supply chain signals. But we do hope that the A3 framework and the five levers that we've discussed today will help you move closer to becoming a master in supply chain analytics. Excellent. Thank you very much. That concludes the presentation portion of our program today. We'll now move on to our Q&A. We've gotten some great questions and we'll continue to take your questions for the remainder of the hour. A reminder that you can submit your questions by entering them into the chat box in the lower corner of your console or on Twitter using the hashtag MITSMR event. First question, great question from our audience. What are the best ways to work around politics in organizations during promoting analytics? Because it can unearth issues which the C-suite executives do not want to address. Would like to tackle that one? <laughs> Martha, this is Barry. I, I think that of the three of us, uh, in, even in an organization like a university, as you well know, politics are always involved. Uh, I think that the top-down mandate, because that was one of the levers, uh, one of the five levers that we talked about, uh, in every organization it's going to exist. Uh, I think that uh, if you think about that uh, success that uh, David Dittman talked about, about, you know, if you wait for you know, even the small victories that that's not going to be sufficient. But I do find that somewhere those converge, that uh, the analytics uh, insight that's gained, the ability to be able to respond to those faster, and we see great uh, things happening like Missy discussed in the Haynes brand. Uh, hopefully that'll take a little bit of the I feel, I think, I believe out of it. And certainly the Coca-Cola case study was one of where they built that kind of uh, skepticism into the model so you had the ability to check. And, and I, I just find that when we build in clear metrics and when we build in that feedback system, it won't entirely do away with it, but certainly it might help to diffuse it a bit. And I'll just add, uh, from my experience, if it's possible to provide some type of benchmarking against your competitors, say for example, who are using analytics to justify the need for analytics, that typically helps. And if you can actually launch a small case study and gain a really big, quick success in your organization, many times that goes a long way inside the organization politically um, to actually uh, justify the, your uh, desire in terms of launching an analytics initiative internally. Got it. You have some great suggestions there. Another question uh, from our audience. You discussed five levers. Which would you say is the most crucial one, without which the other levers have very little meaning? Uh, I knew this was going to, to be uh, the, the question, which is why I said they're not presented in any rank order. Um, if you've noticed, as we talked about them and throughout the presentation, they are all interrelated. I think that if we ask Adam to, to run a statistical analysis on the correlation, uh, while they are distinct, what we find is that they uh, also are somewhat interdependent on each other. I think we each have uh, a, a favorite one that we think is probably more impactful. Uh, and we really think that this is going to be phase two of our study to see if we can't design uh, a way to, to really further examine these to see. Uh, from a supply chain standpoint, and that's the area I represent, I would say that uh, I lean in that direction in the sense that we absolutely have to have uh, the domain and particularly the, the business knowledge for it to be effective. But that's my personal, uh, I would say, bias in, in 
choose. Missy, I'm going to turn it over to you, or perhaps Adam, as to what you think is the most impactful. I, I agree with you, Mary. I don't think that there's really one that you can focus in on. They're all too interrelated. Without a top-down mandate, you're going to be stuck with small victories that aren't really going to amount to much. If the analytics team isn't able to communicate the results and insights to people, no one's going to use it. Uh, I, they're basically, without all five going on at once, you're just not going to see much progress. And that's one of the things that we saw differentiating those four clusters is that metrics describing all five of those levers change simultaneously. We never saw one that was really, really big on number four, but really poor on the others. So unfortunately, there's not one best one to focus on that we can, we can tell you. So I no, agree with no. that. Oh, see, I was just going to confirm I agree with Adam and Mary. I think all five are absolutely critical. And the top-down um, support, it is, I, we just can't underscore how important it is to have support from the top. That makes sense. We have another great question from our audience. Uh, a, a listener asks, I'm not sure I understand what you mean by a data-driven mandate. Are you suggesting an override of other insights in favor of data-driven insights? So this is Mary. So what I would say in terms of the data-driven insights, uh, remember we said that in, in many cases, if we have too complex uh, an approach in terms of what we're doing supply chain analytics, we can end up with uh, insights for which it did contradict often what we are our experiences and gut instincts. So by a data driven, and once again, I'll refer to the, the Coca-Cola refreshments case study, is that in many cases, it may very well be that, that what we, uh, you know, the results of those analysis uh, would say, you know, do A, B, C, and yet in the past we've done perhaps C, D, and E. And so the data-driven part of that is just instead of following, I think, what our instincts are, or in many cases, uh, that gut instinct that we've used before. Uh, in some cases, it can be correct. But often what we find is that if we have the data to support that, that it really, as we said, we have to take the, the other portion out of it and let the analytics guide us. Missy, do you have some insight that you would want to offer on that one? I think you summarized it really well, Mary. Um, it's, I think the data-driven, what we mean by the data-driven mandate is for the organization as a whole to become comfortable with analytics. It, al it has to almost become woven into the fabric of the organization and, and very oftentimes um, it, it's the case that we're so used to doing things the way we've always done them that it's very difficult to break that cycle without some type of a mandate to focus on on the data and let the data tell the story and then let the data help us answer and drive us to the right decision. Yep, I have something to add as well. Um, models can't take into account every single bit of information that we have as well. So there very well might be something that the data doesn't quite capture that does need to be taken into account. And that's where the pressure is really on the uh, analytics professional at the company to be able to explain in very clear terms exactly what the model is doing, what its limitations are, and if there is some sort of contradiction over maybe what gut instinct would suggest and what the data is suggesting for that analytics professional to really be able to explain why is there this contradiction and why should you trust the data in that case. So you don't just go blindly into, you know, uh, just, you know, trusting everything the data has to say. It's always going to be incomplete. You're going to be taking information from other sources. But as an analytics professional, you're really going to have to have that deep, rigorous, thorough understanding of the business to be able to explain in simple terms when people aren't that comfortable with the suggestions, if they fly in the face of what people think should be done. Uh, this is a great comment, Adam, and I'll just add to my original uh, comments to start uh, off this answer. And that is that in, in many cases, uh, models are built on assumptions. 
And anytime we violate those assumptions, which in many cases we do to, to get to some insight or, or answers, we, we have to be aware of what that does to the results that we get out. And I think that's part of what this uh, question was really all about. And, and, and as Adam said, we didn't address the data accuracy or uh, you know, the currency of that information, et cetera. Those always have to be taken into account. Great. Uh, here's another question from the audience. What challenges are, do you see that come up when performing analytics in supply chain when most of your supply chain is outsourced? So I'll uh, comment on that one. Typically, the biggest problem there is syncing the analytics time horizon with your supply chain response time because you have so little control over your supply chain response time if it's outsourced. So I'll address that uh, as well. This is Mary. Uh, you know, coming from the supply chain side, I would say that most of the activities and, and uh, within most firms that have a global presence, which is I think uh, most all of us now that we think about the internet of things, uh, we have a large portions of what we do that are outsourced. So we think about, we talk about collaboration and that communication because we all have a few key suppliers. We have key uh, customers as well. And so that ability to, to be able to use that uh, analytics and to be able, as Missy talked about, uh, that cycle time and gain it, uh, even if we do not own and manage and, and control that, through collaboration, I think that we're able to achieve that end result in terms of decreasing that time from the awareness to the analytics to the action and in that very collaborative, synchronized way that uh, we know that some uh, great supply chains are, are already doing. Excellent. Uh, another uh, listener asks, how would you suggest we talk about the five levers with our CEO? Someone obviously uh, eager to do some implementation. So I would suggest that you take success stories to him to illustrate how each of the five levers can significantly decrease your analytic supply chain cycle time. I think Adam had up earlier a link where you can uh, take uh, a small portion of the uh, survey that will uh, help you understand what cluster uh, you're in. And I think that a part of knowing where you currently are, and I think uh, everybody's goal should be uh, to the extent possible to become a master. I think it really is true when I talked about uh, we are really drowning in data, but I think if we think about how much of that we're able to turn into information and then into insights to change what we're doing, uh, uh, I think our study very clearly showed that very few companies are. But if you look at the results of those that have done that in ways that impact uh, their firm performance across all of those five measures that we talked about, certainly that's a compelling story, I think, for any uh, CEO today, uh, for them to understand that, that we can be in this group as well, and this is where we need to be. Great. We ha have time for one more question. Uh, do, do you have experience with machine learning models in supply chain, and the, did that come up in your research? Oh, that's a Missy question all over, isn't it, Missy? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> so, yeah, and, and Adam, please jump in, because I know Adam's had experience with that firsthand as well. Um, specifically, the predictive models um, used at Haynes were machine learning models. So they were looking at using data mining to do that prediction in terms of anticipating shortages in demand. And so very oftentimes data mining provides an excellent tool in terms of doing predictive analysis. Well, that's all the time we have for today's Q&A session. Over the next few days, please look out for a feedback survey we'll send via email. We greatly appreciate your thoughts and opinions. And that concludes our program today. Thank you again to our presenters, Melissa Bowers, Adam Petrie, and Mary Holcomb, and of course, our sponsor, UPS. A recording of this program and the presentation slides will be available within three to four business days. Thank you for attending our program today.